I have known Keo McClear since 1988, and I'm so delighted that she's here with us. Keo is the author of the book Beclouded Visions, uh, written in 1998, uh, a book that changed my academic course when I read it. Um, it really changed the entire direction of my study, and I'm so grateful to Keo for writing such a beautiful book about the art of witness. Uh, she is currently a PhD student in uh, education at York University, and again, it's such a joy to have her here uh, to present her work this morning. So, Kia. Um, so I just wanted to thank the uh, symposium organizers, Claudette and uh, John O'Brien, for putting together this wonderful uh, weekend. And I also just wanted to say that I haven't done this in a long time. Actually, Claudette took me out of retirement. And I've come here, and, and just in this crowd right now, I can see so many faces that I haven't seen in a long time. And many of us are connected by um, a wonderful man named Roger Simon, who um, was so formative uh, in my thinking about the idea of witnessing. And so um, I want to kind of celebrate him today, but also just to kind of dedicate this talk to him forever that's worth. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm just going to dive right in because I know we're short on time. So I just want to begin by talking about a film by Ian Thomas Ashe, um, which was done in, 19, sorry, in 2013. It's a feature documentary about the medical fallout of Fukushima. And in the documentary, it's called A2BC, a mother wanders the street with her small Geiger counter. It's 18 months after the 2011 nuclear meltdown in Fukushima, and children in the area are suffering from nosebleeds, skin rashes, and thyroid cysts. And this mother, along with many others, has lost her cool. She's lost her composure. And she's wandering the streets. Um, and for basically what she's facing is a lack of transparency on the part of the government um, and the official medical testing kind of bureaucrats who have also kind of ineffectively tried to decontaminate her town. So in the film, um, she's taken radiation monitoring into her own hands, and you see her wandering the streets. It's a very small part of the film, but you see her wandering these kind of ordinary streets with a Geiger counter in hand. Um, and I can never escape that metronomic click, click, click of the Geiger counter as she wanders down these roads. And with that click, 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 what has been mostly offstage until this point in the film, invisible to post-atomic eyes, is made present, or at least acknowledged, as an absence. That click, 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 small yet inescapably persistent, is a sound of the human and non-human world in peril. I want you to hear that click. That mother feels tidal waves of weariness in the film. She feels it when she faces this disembodied thing called government response and post-disaster recovery. She feels it when she's urged to show gaman and patriotic spirit, to pull herself together and show composure. She understands these words, recovery, composure, pulling herself together, to be a defense against the unknown, medical, existential, and emotional import of her situation. The clicking is a reminder to avoid clever and authoritarian interpretations at all costs. The filmmaker, Ian Thomas Ashe, who follows her, is there to tell her that he feels tidal waves of weariness too, and that maybe the storm calms after a time. But the clicking continues, regular, metrical, a fixed auditory pulse. As a country moves on to different tempos at different times, this mother is absorbed, discomposed by the clicking. In this paper, I activate the multiple meanings of the word composure to think about the Fukushima disaster and its unsettling after effects. More than four years have passed since the meltdown, and the ruined facility is still spilling radioactive waste into the ocean. Approximately 120,000 people forced to evacuate their irradiated homes remain in internal exile. Cancer rates in the immediate area around Fukushima Daiichi have increased by almost 6,000%. So it's in this shattered context that I explore the work of a group of photo artists whose images trouble the discourse of composure in post-nuclear Japan. I focus on photography that was included in an exhibition titled In the Wake, Japanese Photographers Respond to 311, that took place earlier this year at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and I believe there's actually the book in the uh, gallery uh, shop at the AGO. Um, so it was interesting that it was held kind of, um, it coincided with the Camera Atomica. It was a kind of busier anniversary year, actually, um, the anniversary of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
So this was notably the first exhibition in the West or Japan to examine the first generation of response to Fukushima in photography. As the Japanese government under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe moves towards a rapid and arguably repressive reconstruction, backing an industry push to return to nuclear power despite public opposition, many of these artists are rejecting the directive to behave as if nothing happened, as if everything is the same. So um, it's May 5th, I'm taking you back to May 5th of this year, um, and I've come to Boston to meet with the curators of In the Wake. And the morning's taken me by surprise. So I arrive at Logan Airport and everything is in high security and I had no idea that it's actually the two year anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombings. And that in less than two weeks, one of the bombers will be sentenced to death. So the city is in high alert and I can feel the security everywhere. And as the airport shuttle bus hurdles me into the city center, I notice posters at fire stations that declare, keep Boston running or keep running Boston. And street banners that announce there's only one Boston. So these signs are ostensibly directed at the marathon runners who were there a few days before my arrival, but they have a broader message. Nothing will destroy the spirit of the city. And I mention the scene of my arrival because it, I think it speaks to the way society recomposes itself after disaster. I've come to an American museum to consider how an exhibition of photography attempts to recompose an event that took place in Japan, only to find a city in the midst of wakeful recomposition. So now I actually need this to work. Do you, is there, oops. There we go. Okay, so this is the museum. So now I've arrived, I've arrived at this beautiful museum and I'm walking through its elegant galleries, home to the world's largest collection of Japanese art outside of Japan. And before me is Hokusai's The Great Wave from 1831, a metonym for Japanese art and an icon in the public imagining of tidal waves, uh, a fact that will soon become significant. And I've seen this print, as I'm sure many of you have, in reproduction so often on mugs and t-shirts, on um, mouse pads, and memorized its particular Prussian blue and the slant of its um, imperiled boats, and always assumed it to be very large, almost as large as the massive force it depicts. And in fact, it's quite tiny. It's about roughly 10 by 15 inches. And so I stand there in this kind of state of disappointment. And then I move through the jostling crowd to a comparatively quieter corner of the gallery which actually it's almost empty. And so I arrive at In the Wake and the show that I've come to see. And my first thoughts are careful, elegant, and composed. And then the next words I have are decorous, understated. There are no visible wounds to be seen. The curatorial selections have veered away from the tragic and spectacular image towards the metaphoric and the oblique. Uh, the first work I've come to see, I see right in front of me, and this is a terrible reproduction, I apologize is um, a work by Nobuyoshi Araki, and it's called Diary of a Photo Mad Old Man. And the photos are each marked with a date in the corner, which depict a range of subjects. Uh, many of them are kind of typically Araki, um, in terms of his repertoire of, of nudes and images of the sky. There are also a few Godzilla figurines. However, thick gouged lines extend across each photo. So on March 11th, Araki went out to photograph the sky as he does every morning when the disaster happened. He quickly returned home, took scissors, and gouged all his negatives to express his frustration, but also to, so also to signal that everything in daily life had been affected. Araki's emotional distress is as much the subject of the photos as anything literally portrayed. So in this particular image, um, the scissor-marked image, he shows umbrella-toting pedestrians in the streets of Tokyo. It's a shadowy evocation of atomic black rain. And standing before them, what you really um, miss right here is the sense of scale. Like they're, well, actually, you get a sense of scale from this, but they're very visceral and they're very violent um, to look at. A few meters away, there's um, a piece, and I'm not going to go through every piece in the show. I just want to go through a few to, to illustrate my point. Um, this piece is by uh, Tomoko Yoneda, and it's called Cumulus. And in this piece, she juxtaposes images of Hiroshima and Fukushima with symbols of imperialist Japan to ask how a bowing to authority paved the way for what the scholar Akira Mizuta Lippitt has called the unthinkable return of radiation. So in this um, particular piece, there's a, a picture of um, Peace Day in Hiroshima uh, juxtaposed with a picture of wilting uh, chrysanthemums. And those are flowers that are normally associated with the Japanese imperial family. And across the room, we see a piece um, by Takashi Homa called Mushrooms from the Forest, 
which also turns um, a, a camera on symbols of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In this case, by photographing radioactive mushrooms from a forest near the Fukushima Daiichi plant. The specimens loom large. They're roughly five feet by four feet. And they're set against um, a, actually a very white field. So what might constitute a suitable response to the disasters aligns itself here with a tasteful minimalism. In my view, as, I'm, as I was experiencing it in person, I felt that they were kind of dangerously and distractingly beautiful. And I know that there was meant, I was meant to be considering the disparity between their kind of um, beautiful outward appearance and their uh, terrible inner toxicity, but I just stood there thinking, Donna Hay cookbook. I, I just, there's something about the presentation that felt very commercial. Um, so there are other works in the exhibition that I won't discuss here for lack of time, but many of them um, uh, are kind of joined in sounding the limits of representation. Some of them feel a bit too formally on the nose using uh, techniques like tonal reversal or intense color contrast to represent an irradiated, irradiated world. I think um, a bit more subtle is this piece, uh, which some of you might recognize, by Shinpei Takeda. It's called Trace. And I think one of these pieces appears in Camera Atomica. Um, so uh, Takeda used a technique known as autoradiography um, to expose spaces around Fukushima that have been affected by radiation. And um, what, it, what I think you get is these kind of really visually arresting um, images that kind of resemble you know, galaxies or stars. So all of these works are very beautiful, and it's not that any of them are lacking on their own terms. But the overall atmosphere of refinement and restraint, while offering a reflective contrast to the storm of news images that surrounded 311, feels a bit too smooth and uniform. I cannot shake the feeling that many of the images risk being absorbed within the decorative and decorous visual grammar that pervades the rest of the museum's collection of Japanese art. A reminder, perhaps, that what might possess potency when encountered individually is sometimes blunted en masse. I think the risk of showing art with such a lovely high technical finish is that it places what is already geographically and digestibly distant in an even more remote frame, verging on what the historian Edward T. Leinenthal has termed the comfortable horrible. But then I hear a sound, a clicking, and I discover that there's a small room in the back corner of the exhibition gallery that is crowded with people and feeling. And so to this point, I've seen maybe two people in the gallery space. But in this small gallery, there are three screens that complicate the curatorial address of the exhibition by introducing other genres of disaster imagery. On one screen is a video installation of a deserted uh, traffic intersection in uh, Futa Futaba, Fukushima, which is part of the no-go zone. And it's actually one of the most highly contaminated areas of Fukushima. And um, it's accompanied by the clicking of a Geiger counter. So again, that clicking. And on the second screen are slides from a fundraising project by the Japanese Red Cross um, that show aid workers going into Fukushima. But it's the third screen that has um, actually drawn the crowd. And I'm just going to play this. So on the third screen, um, there are about two, around the third screen, there are about two dozen visitors when I arrive. And they're sitting or standing, and they're watching muted real-time footage that the Japanese network NHK broadcast of the tsunami um, on the day that it happened. So this isn't the exact footage, but it gives you a sense. So in the footage that I'm watching, a thick black cloak reaches across the Sendai rice paddies and fields. Seen from an aerial perspective, it's difficult to gauge its force. At first, it seems swampish and slow. It's only in seeing its destructive sweep of roads and trucks and houses that the tsunami's terrifying momentum becomes clear. It's obliterating everything in its path. I hear the Geiger counter click clicking ra rapidly as everyone falls quiet. When I later ask the curators about the decision to include this footage, which seems to be the exhibition's main draw, one of them, Anne Morse Nishimura, says, I felt fairly strongly about including the NHK footage because a lot of people in this country needed some reminder that the tsunami did not look like the great wave. I think in some people's minds it was this beautiful cresting thing. I'm aware that a formal binary is being created in the exhibition between evidentiary and more aesthetic forms of photo witnessing. But I'm also aware that among the visitors that I encounter, the refinement and conceptual demands of the art on view seem to have produced a hunger for the seeming artlessness of the news camera. I appreciate the fact that the curators are open to the contradictories, the dialogic tensions between narratives of order and chaos, 
art and artlessness. This room feels like a rebuttal, a swerving away from the low-key conceptualism of the main room. The curators, alert to the issues raised by creating art from such harrowing events, invite us to shuttle between the two spaces, recognizing that neither alone can stand for 311 and its aftermath. As W.G. Sebald once wrote, the issue then is not to resolve, but to reveal the conflict. And all of this happens over the stuttered clicking of a Geiger counter. So this photo was sent to me um, last night, actually, by a scholar named Tomoe Otsuki. Um, and it shows, it's, it was recently published in uh, EcoWatch. It shows a man standing at, that, uh, at an intersection in Futaba, which is that highly um, uh, radioactive or um, uh, kind of toxic space in Fukushima. Um, where no cleanup has happened because of the high radiation. And this man is standing under a sign that says, nuclear power is the energy of a bright future. And I was, I was thinking about this when, um, when Blake was showing the, the uh, image of Port Hope, the town that radiates friendliness. Um, so um, I just wanted to show that image to you now. But um, in, the sh in the actual uh, companion book that accompanies the show that I was just talking about in the wake, the Japanese art historian Michio Hayashi addresses the surging nationalistic sentiment after 311, and he points to how the shaping of a unitary Japanese identity and recovery discourse, complete with slogans that resembled Boston slogans, such as Japan is one, go Japan go, have fueled a rise in racism and xenophobia targeting foreigners, and especially other Asians. The Japanese concept of communal bonds, or kizuna, that rules out unwanted noise or unwanted messages, Hayashi argues, has been misappropriated to block perception of the history that brought the nation to its present situation, as well as to erase differences and dissonances among the community of victims and survivors. Even the language of Japanese composure, repeatedly used by the Japanese media and also the international media, has depicted stoicism as a virtue of the Japanese. And this has been used in highly disciplinary ways when comparing um, the kind of disaster um, response in Japan to the disaster response in Katrina. And you see how, how heavily racialized the discourse, media discourse is around, around that and how um, the Japanese kind of are, um, are constructed as these kind of model disaster citizens. Um, and I think that that's, that's worth thinking about. Um, so, I mean, in Japan, this, this discourse of composure is used so much that if you do not stay composed in the face of disaster or in the face of terrifying calamity, um, you're considered not really Japanese. So it's perhaps unsurprising then that, that um, within Japan, this discourse of staying composed has made it difficult for those still living in the wake of disaster to uh, express unresolved griefs and grievances. Normal psychological and political responses to the triple disaster, and Fukushima specifically, continue to be presented as pathological, anti-social, anti-patriotic behaviors um, verging on treason. So what becomes apparent is that composure is not simply a measure of a society's capacity for endurance or a measure of a seismically vulnerable country's ability to adapt to you know, nature's disastrous rhythms, but rather it's a a vision and a version of conformity that renders any opposition to the status quo impermissible. It's an effort to sublimate emotions and moods and particularly feelings of grief and anger that might compel citizens to think about the circumstances that led to the man-made tragedy of Fukushima. This is a kind of mastery, Adam Phillips suggests, this domination of the individual and social body in the name of composure, this disavowal of its agitations in the name of public order. It comes with the injunction to behave as if nothing happened, as if everything is the same. I just wanted to show you a little bit of a piece. Oops. Sorry. So this piece that I'm, I'm going to talk about is um, a piece by Eiko Otake. She's a 70-year-old um, uh, dancer um, who's quite well-known internationally. And um, I think that a very different, more agitated disposition pervades the art of her, uh, pervades her work. Um, and I'm just going to press play and hope for the best. So, um, I don't need the volume. Thanks. 
So this is part of a series, a touring series of photographs um, of Eiko Take performing in deserted train stations and neighborhoods in Fukushima. And the photographs, while elegantly composed, I think are also very unsettling. Um, and Eiko's trying to perform, or she is performing, different emotions such as bitterness, anger, sadness. As she writes in her artist statement, and this is, um, this is I have to remind you that this is um, like the no-go zone. This is the exclusion area in Fukushima. So it's, that's why it's completely deserted. So she writes in her artist statement, as we got closer and closer to the reactor site, I wailed and lamented not only for the people who were affected by the radiation, in addition to the, national, in, in addition to the natural disaster, but also for the naked earth and sea that were irradiated, contaminated, and stained. The intense physicality of Eiko's presence in the wasted landscape of Fukushima is a spectral memorializing presence. It borders on what might be called the melodramatic in order to call up the disastrous human effects of the meltdown. So among the best known artists responding to Fukushima um, is a six member artist collective known as Chimpom. And they're kind of agitprop and kind of anarchist in their, um, in their uh, approach. And um, they drew, I'm not going to discuss a lot of their work, but I will mention this one piece. Um, in April 2011, less than a month after the uh, reactor meltdown, they uh, breached the barricades around Fukushima Daiichi wearing hazmat suits. And you can see the smoldering reactors behind them. And they unfurled a white banner, which they then painted with a red circle to represent the Japanese flag, and then surrounded that circle with three demarcations to represent um, the international symbol for radiation. And then they ho um, hoisted this flag onto a flagpole. So when I asked the curators of In the Wake why they didn't include the photographic work of Eiko Otake or Chimpom in the show, they remarked that while they considered it, ultimately the work did not fit tonally. And I mention these works now not to detract from In the Wake and its curatorial intentions, but to suggest that there are other Fukushima photographs that are also worth thinking about. Images that are forceful and adversarial and perhaps less refined. Compromising their own physical and mental well-being, these artists shifted the spectatorial frame by traveling to the no-go zone in Fukushima and exposing themselves to radiation, putting themselves in considerable jeopardy. Refusing the image of a composed pro-atomic future. So how do we resolve to live with discomposure, with being undone, if the option is an order that presumes a kind of naturalized national identity that is predicated upon authoritarianism and denial. Refusing the call to order is not a matter of clinging to chaos, nor is it a melancholic acceptance of things as they are, but rather, the way I see it, is it's leaving ourselves open so that we do not harden with purpose or recompose ourselves too quickly in the name of efficiency, res uh, respectability, or a pseudo-peace. We have seen the fallout of an acquiescent and restrictive model of nuclear recovery in Japan. We have seen the unthinkable return of radiation. In the face of all that remains unknown and unfinished, I would like to suggest that refusing the call to order or call to composure is an affirmation of solidarity. We make common cause with those people in positions that are perturbed and ill-composed, and in this alignment, provoke Actually, not just in this alignment, but also in this um, um, ability to be uncongenial to power. And I want to borrow Ian's beautiful phrase, being uncongenial to power. In being uncongenial to power, in this alignment, we provoke the possibilities of new action and a reshaped future. So I, I'm going to end where um, I began. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I'm having technical issues, sorry. This is part of my being ill-composed. Um, so the volume is here, is it out? Okay, so I don't want to make it too loud, but um, I'm going to end with the mothers of Fukushima. And um, I just want to say that th these mothers um, in this film are never identified because um, they all fear reprisal. And they've all been categorized by Japan's pro-nuclear scholars and right-wing media as crazy and unpatriotic. And many of them have been attacked. People have kind of tried to scout out their identities and have attack, attacked them in various ways. There, uh, many of them are in marriages that are dissolving or partnerships that are dissolving because the families can't agree on the proper response to this disaster. And um, so even within their families, there's a sense of um, discomposure. 
Um, so, but by challenging the story that, they've been, that has been composed for them, these mothers of Fukushima seek to deny Japan its composure about radiation. When their anxiety meets the composure of government officials, they are deemed hysterical. How dare they poison the image of Japan with their talk of radio radioactive poison? And in this final clip, I think what we see is a wavering defense of self. Composure as protective armor, as disavowal, cannot be maintained. It comes at too high a cost. And I'm just going to intro this by saying that um, they're talking about what will happen when the snow melts in the springtime um, and the radiation starts to seep into the rivers in Fukushima where they live. わかるべきですね。その通り、その通りです。で、来る繰り返されるわけだから、冬になって金葉が出て、山の焼かれ葉は今度また、あの土が水になって降りてくるわけですから。川の、あの、なんか原点、赤ちゃんって分かります落ち
And I would have liked to see more emotion coming out of, I, I appreciated the emotion of that Japanese woman and I would like to see more emotion in an academic conference as well. Thank you. I appreciate yours, thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Th thank you for two fantastic presentations, and I, um, I have a question that I, either one of you or both of you, I would welcome your kind of response. And I, in both cases, I was really thinking about like what might constitute a kind of ethics of seeing when we, when there are many, many examples where uh, immoral, um, contemporary, uh, immoral political acts are constituted precisely in the act of making something visible. And certainly we could think about the Colin Powell and the UN Security Council <laughs> mobilizing, producing images in order to kind of justify the invasion of Iraq. So I would, in some way, um, I understand the demand for uh, an image. And, and I would like to, I'm asking myself, I suppose, and asking both of you to speculate on um, both this demand, but how we might what kind of counter image can we actually produce uh, in relationship to um, certain, uh, the demand for an image, particularly when, when we understand the ethical implications of making visible today? I think it's a great question. We probably have very different approaches to that question. And I actually would kind of open it up to the audience, but I'm. I think I'm increasingly interested in the way the visual becomes a form of terror management. I'm just a Bora Blake's term. And um, I'm, my work now is kind of focused on climate change. And I'm really interested in how the visual doesn't help us often in climate change. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Rob Nixon, who's talked about the slow violence of climate change and the environmentalism of the poor. But in many cases, like the kind of red button variety kind of narrative that we had around the nuclear age uh, isn't available when we talk about um, climate change. And so the lack of kind of visual evidence is a problem often because the violence of climate change can be so slow and incremental and invisible um, in uh, frontline communities until the kind of, there's the kind of um, the eruptive event of a tsunami or a hurricane. But um, I, that's not an answer to your question, but I, it is a really fascinating question. And I'm sure Joseph has something to say. Yeah, I agree. It's a fantastic question. It's maybe the question of our moment in, in many respects. Um, so, you know, the mushroom cloud imagery that, that comes out of the U.S. is something that's carefully crafted to do a bunch of ideological work. It distances the viewer from the event, creates a kind of uh, aesthetic sublime. It, it was very much a deliberative project in coming up with a kind of branding of a uh, nuclear war that could do a certain kind of work in the, in the mid-20th century. And the question of, of that exemplar is one that I think haunts like pretty much every visualization strategy after. And, uh, you know, so there's lots of, of folks working on things like climate change that are asking, you know, what's the mushroom cloud for climate change? What's the thing that in a single indexical image can capture, um, you know, this, this world of complex processes and use it as a mobilization strategy? So I don't have the answer to this, but I do think that, that like the terms of visualization, particularly as we see more ubiquitous big data projects happening across society and across pretty much every kind of problem, uh, th this issue of how, uh, how the visual is politicized um, and the power of it to both mobilize and immobilize is part of the dynamic that, that I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in trying to assess. Using the nuclear case, which is uh, kind of an exemplary form because it uh, it's connected not only to, to violence on an unprecedented scale, but also it built out this enormous complex of people that were deeply committed to it. And how the visualization strategies within, uh, you know, within that regime functioned, I think, are crucial to the story and a bit, and a bit uh, uh, worthy of, of more interrogation. We're going to take one more question, maybe the lady in the front. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for absolutely fascinating presentations. And I have a million, million, million questions, but I have to reduce them to one or two. Uh, to, first of all, to Joe uh, Masco and then to Kyo. Um, um, 
I was wondering, jo Joseph, um, if you, it's speculation on my part because I've been thinking of uh, this question of whether um, the, um, based on what you said today and of your previous work in both Nuclear Borderlands and theater, the Theater of Operations and all the other essays you have published, for instance, uh, on the metaphor of the fallout, um, and so on and so forth, um, whether um, the whole history of uh, film and photography, lens-based visual media of the 20th century could be rewritten um, according to the visualization regimes and ways of seeing that could, uh, that were, that was built by the nuclear complex uh, in the first, uh, first of all, by the nuclear complex in the United States, but also by other nuclear complexes, for instance, in Japan, and that is also addressed to what Kyo said, uh, it's a history which has remained uh, uh, through the second part of the 20th century in Japan very much uh, hidden, camouflaged, and censored. So that is one question uh, related to that, uh, whether, uh, because um, you have put into circulation, Joe, uh, talk, uh, relating to what Kyo was saying, uh, do we have the vocabulary for talking about this invisibility? You put into circulation uh, expressions like nuclear uncanny. So you're talking about also the politics of the, uh, these regimes of visualization, the question of uh, we also need to look at the psychopolitics. So can we talk about an on top power? Um, uh, Brian Masumi has said the current logic of the current um, uh, military nuclear complex, uh, global nu military nuclear complex, the logic of preemption, which is very much, uh, uh, which is what counterterrorism politics is about in the United States. So, um, can we talk about the onto power of these regime of the visualization? Uh, this is one question. And to Q, um, um, uh, we are running off of time. So, uh, how did you think about? The, uh, precisely how Japanese artists today are reacting to Fukushima and post-Fukushima thing, the question that they have to resort to uh, invisible exhibitions in the nuclear zone, in the exclusion zone, in order to precisely make visible their anger. I will say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. And I think that also one of the things that we can do as people who care about visual culture and cultural analysis is we can attend to the ways in which um, images are naturalized and deployed around uh, both in commercial uh, films and images and uh, through mass media in such a way to create atmospheres in which certain ideas, certain dangers, certain threats in particular are constituted without any materiality to those, those threats. And to think about those things as basic mechanisms now of media cultures and, and political cultures. I'm going to have to cut it off there. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Keo and Joe, for your remarkable presentations. We'll see you all back at 2.30.